Good evening, everybody, and welcome, very warm welcome to the 2018 Chorley Lecture. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the LSE or back to the LSE this evening um, and for um, another instalment of our, our Chorley series. And a particularly warm welcome to our speaker this evening, who's Professor Adrian Vermeule. And I'm sure he's known to all of you. Um, he's obviously the John. I'm going to put my glasses on. John H. Watson, professor at Harvard, uh, graduate of Harvard, had a little interregnum at Chicago Law School, but I'm sure he's forgiven for that. Um, and his focus is on uh, constitutional administrative law and theory and uh, theories of institutional design. And you'll, you'll know he's a prolific author, um, including an author of eight books, uh, for example, Judging Under Uncertainty and Institutional Theory of Legal Interpretation, uh, Law and the Limits of Reason, and with Eric Posner, Terror in the Balance. And I'm delighted to welcome him this evening uh, to give his lecture, which is The Publius Paradox on the Dangers of a Weak Executive. Um, and you'll know from convention, if you've been to Chorley lectures before, that we don't have questions at the end of Chorley lectures. Instead, we go for drinks. <laughs> Uh, and you'll be even more delighted to know that we will be continuing with that convention this evening. Um, so I'd like to give you a very warm welcome, if I may, to our speaker tonight. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Black. Uh, Julia, if I may, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, see some, some old uh, friends, and to be in this room, which I always find extremely striking and intimidating, so I'll, I'll try to do my best. Um, I will begin tonight with a dictum of Alexander Hamilton's at the Philadelphia Convention, assembled to draft a new constitution uh, in the States in 1787. A warning, this is not the new lovable Hamilton of the stage. Um, this is the real Hamilton. Uh, and here's what he said. He said, establish a weak government, and you must at times overleap the bounds. Rome was obliged to create dictators. We must remember that in Hamilton's usage, speaking as a man educated in the English tradition of the time, government here would typically refer to an incumbent administration. It's not clearly specified how it would apply in a system of separated powers with an independently elected executive and legislature. Of course, such a system had not come into being at the national level. Um, so Hamilton is saying then ambiguously with respect to either government generally or the executive in particular, that a certain dynamic warrants attention where natural circumstances, not foreseen and perhaps not foreseeable in advance, require it. Excessive weakness of government tends to become excessive strength by a kind of necessity of circumstances. If the bonds of constitutionalism are drawn too tight, they will be thrown off altogether when imperative need arises. Now, I know how uh, we uh, academics think, I can just hear someone out there thinking, uh, well, what does excessive mean, and so on and so forth. I will get to the analytics shortly, uh, but I believe in lumping before splitting. Uh, so what I'll first do is uh, bring together a bunch of illustrations in the neighborhood of this, of this dynamic. Um, and then I'll say a few analytic things, then I'll turn to some implications of this um, paradox. The main one being that the Constitution uh, should be cast as a loosely fitting garment, particularly the executive component of the Constitution and the scope of executive powers. I won't be so uncautious as to try to venture examples from the history of British constitutionalism, except insofar as American constitutionalism is a kind of offshoot uh, thereof, but I hope the picture resonates with at least some of your experience. All right, let me begin with some examples. I'll begin in a slightly odd place, although as a Dutchman, this is near and dear to my heart, the Netherlands States General uh, in Federalist 20, titled The Insufficiency of the Present Confederation to Preserve the Union. Uh, Hamilton used a running example of a crippled constitutional order, and his running example was the Netherlands. Uh, and Hamilton's claim is that the constitutional order of the Netherlands was crippled by radical decentralization, by a proliferation of checks and balances, born of suspicion of the executive that is the stadtholder, the House of Orange, uh, and a peculiar system of taxation in which uh, the top level government was dependent upon contributions from the provinces for collection. As a result, the Netherlands was a, a byword for weakness. 
Hamilton said, what are the characters which practice is stamped upon this? Imbecility in the government, discord among the provinces, foreign influence and indignities, a precarious existence in peace, and peculiar calamities from war. But the Netherlands was perpetually surrounded by aggressive enemies, and necessity proved to be the mother of power. Hamstrung by the law, the States General and the Prince of Orange did what was needed to provide for the common defense and general welfare. As for taxes, said Hamilton, it has more than once happened that the deficiencies had to be ultimately collected at the point of the bayonet, a thing practicable, though dreadful, in a confederacy where one of the members exceeds in force all the rest. More generally, he said, in critical emergencies, the states general are often compelled to overleap their constitutional bounds. So here's an echo of Hamilton's earlier formulation at the Philadelphia Convention. From all this, Hamilton drew a general conclusion. A weak constitution must necessarily terminate in dissolution for want of proper powers or the usurpation of powers requisite for the public safety. Whether the usurpation once begun will stop at the salutary point or go forward to a dangerous extreme must depend on the contingencies of the moment. Tyranny has perhaps often or grown out of the assumptions of power called for on pressing exigencies by a defective constitution than out of the full exercise of the largest constitutional authorities. So tyranny in the sense of exceeding constitutional bounds is for Hamilton a result of the weakness of government, not of its strength. Or more precisely, the weakness of government combined with circumstances that require strength. What I have called uh, elsewhere tyrannophobia, the unjustified terror of governmental power, and in particular executive power, on this view risks something. It risks perversely tending to bring about the very state of affairs that it fears. Now, none of this is an argument for dictatorship, certainly not in the loose modern sense or in the pre more precise Roman constitutional sense. Publius sees the Roman dictatorship as a distinctly second best response to poor institutional arrangements. I'll come back to this shortly. But the whole point is that it is an unfortunate symptom of the excessive weakness of government, not of its strength. A second example, one of the major debates of our founding era, uh, uh, derived in a way from a long-running debate in English constitutionalism, and it involved uh, standing armies. So our anti-federalists, the opponents of the proposed constitution, argued that standing armies were an engine of executive tyranny. They said there was a hazard that any army will subvert the forms of the government under whose authority they are raised and establish one according to the pleasure of their leader. So they proposed that standing armies should be sharply limited in times of peace, minimal garrisons only, um, uh, and that uh, the goal of constitutional design should be to minimize this risk of, risk of military, um, military coups. But Publius arguing for the new constitution carried the day, and the new constitution did allow Congress to appropriate money uh, for a standing army for up to two years. This was a sort of anticipatory example of the Publius paradox. It resulted in no observed institutional practice because Publius's successful argument prevented a possible example of the paradox from ever coming about. How did Publius win over his audience? He argued cleverly that a prohibition on a national standing army would itself endanger liberty. So Hamilton excelled himself as a public rhetorician in, in an outstanding series of papers on the issue, um, particularly Federalist Number 8, uh, titled The Effects of War in Producing Standing Armies and Other Institutions Unfriendly to Liberty which offered a sustained case that the main risk of generating tyranny arose from drawing the constraints on the federal military too tightly. If anti-federalists blocked ratification of the proposed constitution, Hamilton warned the states would be forced to militarize, and this would result in systematic expansion of executive authority, in doing which their, that is, the state constitutions would acquire a progressive direction towards monarchy. We should in a little time see established in every part of this country the same engines of despotism which have been the scourge of the old world. Our liberties themselves would be a prey to the means of defending ourselves against the ambition and jealousy of each other. Excessive constraints would produce predictable reactions that would make things worse on the very dimension of public liberty. 
All right, so far I've focused on Hamilton, but I really do mean Publius, the uh, notional joint author of The Federalist. And to prove this to you, uh, let me just say a few words about Federalist 41, which is one of Madison's most sweeping declarations of principle. Uh, interestingly neglected principles that have a distinct tendency to underwrite robust governmental authority. The macro claim of Federalist 41 is uh, that what Madison calls the abuse of power by government um, should not be strictly minimized, but instead optimized. Um, to attempt to elim eliminate it altogether would be counterproductive. And Madison also used standing armies in this way, but with a slightly different spin than Hamilton. Madison said, the means of security can only be regulated by the means and the danger of attack. The main regulator of the means of security is the environment, not law. They will, in fact, this is Madison, be ever determined by these rules and by no others. It is in vain to oppose constitutional barriers to the impulse of self-preservation. It is worse than in vain because it plants in the Constitution itself necessary usurpations of power, every precedent of which is a germ of unnecessary and multiplied repetitions. A polity will defend itself according to the pragmatic imperatives of natural circumstances, whatever law might say. In these situations, were the law to attempt to impose rigid barriers, it will result only in violations that become precedents. The violations, rather than remaining safely outside the legal system, unlegal or illegal, themselves become new precedents for use by future executives, expanding the range of their powers. Well, how does this happen? Why exactly do, do violations become precedents? There's a long analytic answer one could pursue involving the, the normative power of the factual. So this is the phenomenon which I think is rather poorly understood by which actually existing practices become imbued with a normative glow and take on a kind of opinio juris, a sense of obligation. But rather than pursue an analytic approach to the issue, let me instead offer a very brief literary one and simply recite uh, one of Franz Kafka's famous parables, The Leopards in the Temple. Here it is. Leopards break into the temple and drink to the dregs what is in the sacrificial pitchers. This is repeated over and over again. Finally, it can be calculated in advance and it becomes a part of the ceremony. What begins as wild, a violation of boundaries, when repeated, domesticates itself, becoming part of custom. It's a special type of custom to be sure, a custom pegged to an intermittent and irregularly occurring event, but recognizable nonetheless as a norm of social order. And in so doing, it changes the boundaries of the domestic and the wild themselves. All right, uh, well, that will help me draw a further distinction that will allow me to introduce some nuance in a further range of cases. Uh, while we have the leopards in view, um, it will be a distinction between a domesticated version of the paradox occurring within the legal system and a wild version of the paradox, which the executive, executive actually goes beyond the legal system or even breaches explicit legal constraints. This may, and I very cautiously stress the word may, uh, be somewhat analogous, maybe, may, maybe, <laughs> to the Commonwealth legal distinction between ordinary and extraordinary prerogative. If I've hashed that up, take it as a, a good faith effort to kind of play, play in your sandbox uh, <laughs> and ignore the analogy without prejudice to the rest of my argument. To motivate the distinction, let me return to Hamilton's full statement at the Philadelphia Convention with a focus now on the second sentence. Establish a weak government and you must at times overleap the bounds. Rome was obliged to create dictators. There's a severe ambiguity in this, whether intended or otherwise. On one reading, overleap the bounds suggests exceeding the meets and bounds of legally granted power, throwing off the bonds of constitutionalism altogether. Uh, and uh, in a modern sense, the reference to dictators so suggests. On the other hand, there was certainly not the sense that Hamilton would have uh, heard or intended. The Roman dictatorship of the Republican period before Sulla was of course itself an institution shaped and constrained by Rome's unwritten constitutional mores. Hamilton surely understood this. On this interpretation, Hamilton meant something more domesticated. 
that where the ordinary legal powers of the executive are too weak, then under certain emergency conditions, one must overleap the bounds by triggering a special legal mechanism for expanded executive powers. That is a mechanism in some sense itself contained within the law, even if by that we mean a customary and unwritten law. On yet a third hand, however, Hamilton speaks not of the use of dictators as an established institution, but of their initial creation. Um, and we don't know a lot about the initial creation of the dictatorship, except to think that, um, logically speaking, uh, one suspects there was a point at which it came into being without antecedent mores licensing its coming into being, strictly on logical grounds. And as we've seen, the leopards and the temple mechanism entails that the distinction between domesticated and wild versions of the paradox will in the long run start to blur anyway. The whole thing strikes me as ambiguous. I won't attempt to pin down what exactly Hamilton in mind, but what I will do is take the ambiguity as an invitation to illustrate both types of case. So let me begin with uh, two cases firmly within the legal system. So these are cases in which the attempt to constrain government power ends up having perverse effects, ex in fact, expanding executive power, uh, government power. So um, one of the great controversies of the Obama administration was the so-called Jerusalem pa passport controversy. So for a long time, there was an equilibrium in the US. Presidents would proclaim that Jer Jerusalem is the legitimate capital of Israel, and they would announce a someday intention to move the US embassy there but then they would decline to formally recognize it as such or to actually move the embassy. Uh, and they would say that such matters should be bargaining chips in a process of negotiation. Left unclear was the exact scope of the presidency's authority in such matters. It was uh, shrouded by a kind of um, uh, constitutional ambiguity. In 2002, however, Congress became impatient uh, and it tried to force the issue by enacting a statute that uh, conditioned appropriations in such a way as to constrain presidential authority and force the president to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, and it gave US citizens a right, uh, US citizens born in Jerusalem, sorry, a right uh, to list Israel as their place of birth on their passports. So this upset the pre-existing equilibrium of uncertainty and sort of tacit compromise. The president first tried to have the whole issue declared non-justiciable, not legally cognizable by the courts, but uh, the Supreme Court itself raised the stakes, saying, no, this is fully justiciable. We will not leave it to the ambiguous processes of interbranch negotiation. We will make this a question of principle. So the stakes are rising relentlessly. Four years later, uh, after that Supreme Court decision, in a new Supreme Court decision with some new justices, in Zivotofsky versus Kerry, the court issued one of the most sweeping affirmations of presidential power in its history, declaring the statute unconstitutional as an interference with the sole and exclusive executive power to recognize foreign nations and conduct foreign affairs. The court reasoned, uh, quoting Hamilton in Federalist 70, that circumstantial needs for decision, activity, secrecy, and dispatch required that the president alone should possess the relevant powers, even in the face of clear contrary legislation. What began as an attempt to dispel uncertainty by constraining the presidency um, became an engine for clarifying and expanding presidential power. Another example uh, from the Obama administration involved uh, the uh, counterterrorism measures so here's a stylized version of events. The courts in the late Bush administration placed new constraints on the extrajudicial detention of enemy combatants in Guantanamo. One alternative would be judicial detention, transferring captured enemy combatants to domestic courts for criminal trials. It may be that um, the Supreme Court expected that would happen. In fact, however, the new constraints caused the Obama administration to explore three other alternatives, which in important ways resulted in new expansions of executive power. One was to detain more suspected enemy combatants at the Bagram military base in Afghanistan and other sites that um, were, shall we say, even less visible to the law. A second program was aggressive rendition, 
in which a suspected enemy combatant would be turned over to, say, the Egyptian or Syrian intelligence services for a nice chat with back sharing of the resulting intelligence. A third alternative uh, that the administration came to rely on rather heavily was simply not to detain enemy combatants at all. The third alternative was to rain death upon them uh, and their friends, relatives, and anyone in the immediate vicinity from the skies. So uh, the notable expansion of the drone program in the Obama administration had the great virtue from the administration's standpoint of evading all the legal constraints on detention. Um, it's not obvious that this is uh, a better world. Um, one suspects that um, uh, some wish that the legal constraints were not drawn quite so tightly. Uh, and in several important cases involving US citizen enemy combatants, the resulting strikes represented a noticeable, no, notable expansion of executive power to inflict death on US citizens abroad without judicial due process. So this was simply by executive decision making. Okay, third example, um, I'd like to give an example from the Trump administration to prove my bipartisan bona fides. Um, I'm confident that this administration will supply in overflowing measure tales of executive perversity. Um, unfortunately, it's a bit early to have the full story on any of these issues. Um, but I think uh, one should keep an eye on the litigation over the so-called uh, travel ban. This is an executive order that in its current form limits entry from a set of predominantly Muslim nations whose screening procedures for terrorism have been deemed inadequate by the administration. The ban has been sharply challenged in the lower courts, but has found a far more favorable reception at the Supreme Court. Uh, and most observers uh, predict at least a qualified or partial win for the administration. It would not surprise me in the least if the court's eventual decision ended up making presidential power more explicit and expansive as in the Jerusalem passports case. So not only more expansive than relative to the lower court decisions, more expansive than relative to the pre-litigation status quo baseline. Indeed, at the oral argument on the travel ban, uh, Justice Elena Kagan, former dean of Harvard Law School, a uh, rock-ribbed conservative <laughs> exclaimed that the challengers were asking the court to review a presidential declaration of a national security emergency and said that that was obviously beyond the judicial role. Think about that for a second. Obviously beyond the judicial role to review a presidential declaration of a national security emergency. If the court ends up saying that expressly, it will become another classic high watermark of judicial deference to presidential power. All right, um, let me turn now to some less domesticated, what I've called wild possibilities. Uh, these are ones in which the paradox threatens to breach the boundaries of the legal system altogether. I'll start with the separation of powers um, and some, I, I wanna be clear, these are very speculative uh, suggestions and possibilities, but um, I just want to put them on the table for discussion. So an absolute article of faith in among American constitutional lawyers is that the separation of legislative from executive power is essential to prevent the catastrophic scenario of an executive coup against the Constitution, either in the form of a military coup against the presidency or in the form of a presidential coup against other branches. There's at least some reason to discuss, however, the possibility that the separation of powers justified as a barrier against catastrophe actually exacerbates the risk of catastrophe. So uh, let me begin with the military coup scenario. The standard idea would be that the separation of powers creates two sets of monitors for the military, both legislative oversight and executive control, and that this increased scrutiny produces greater control overall. However, the political scientist Samuel Huntington famously conjectured that the separation of powers might reduce, not enhance, civilian control of the military by allowing the military to foment or exploit conflicts between civilian institutions, a type of divide and conquer strategy. Now this is the sort of question that is extremely difficult to prove or disprove, but there has been at least one major comparative study of civil military relations between the uh, United Kingdom and the United States. And this study finds that uh, civilian control of the military is um, distinctly greater in the United Kingdom than in the United States 
due to the relative consolidation of legislative executive relations. And this is very much in line with Huntington's conjecture. A second version, um, the political scientist Juan Linz argued that systems with a separately elected presidential executive were particularly prone to coups, at least when political parties are weak and fractured by proportional representation. The idea was that the multiple veto points created by a separation of power system tended to create severe gridlock in times of economic crisis or other natural conditions, creating strong public demand, the populace would call upon the strong arm of the dictator in the modern sense to clear away the antiquated obstacles of the Constitution. P precisely because the constraints of the separation of powers were too tight, the eventual reaction would be to shatter them altogether. Now, I'm no political scientist. Um, I do know this is a hotly disputed thesis. Linz's main cases were from Latin America, where most of the presidential systems are, so that's where you have to go to look at, look at the hypothesis. Um, the problem is in Latin America, there um, has historically been a correlation with underdevelopment, which might independently tend to produce political instability. Linz uh, pointed to Argentina as a case of a well-developed economy that had fallen to a coup. It's hard to know, but I simply advance it as a non-crazy possibility that would uh, illustrate the, the mechanism I'm interested in. Here's one that's on more solid grounds empirically. Um, there's been an interesting recent scholarship on the effect of executive term limits um, and this scholarship finds that uh, constitutional term limits on the executive tend to increase the risk of executive coups against the Constitution. The theory of the executive term limit is that it reduces the risk of coups by preventing a single person from accreting too much power over time. However, there's a severe unintended consequence that may in some circumstances swamp the intended effect. The unintended consequence is that the term limit removes the incentive of strong executives to continue to play within the system, to continue to seek re-election. Uh, economists call this a final period problem. So anticipating that re-election in the last period is illegal, most executives will step down or try to obtain an amendment to the Constitution. Others will simply subvert the Constitution <laughs> altogether. Well. I've thrown a bunch of examples out there. Some will uh, be apposite, some will be less so. Um, I simply want to motivate the topic. Um, let me turn now to some analytics uh, and then to implications. I think the heart of the Publius paradox is a recogni recognition of the risks of constitutional libertarianism. To draw the bonds of constitutional constraint ever tighter is to create a political risk that we can analyze the way we analyze other political risks. Um, and the risk is a reaction that tears the Constitution apart. So another way to put the paradox is that it counsels against a particular mistaken assumption, that the relationship between constraint and power is linear. Now it's true that the relationship between legal constraint and legal authority is indeed linear, but only because the latter is the converse of the former. Authority is not the same as power. The mistake in the assumption arises because as constraint tightens, power, and as I'll explain particularly executive power, does not decrease linearly, nor do the risks of abuse of that power. At a certain point, the curve may bend around, and too much constraint produce a greater risk of abuse and more costly abuse as well. I don't, of course, mean to deny the converse point that too little constraint can have bad effects um, by licensing abuse of power. Um, that's the main thought of liberal constitutionalism, uh, and it's a good thought. Um, my objection is that sometimes it seems to be the only thought. It is the expected backdrop against which the Publius paradox defines itself. There's a more sophisticated version of it um, supplied by my colleague Jack Goldsmith, who observes that constraint itself can sometimes supply the very precondition for executive power. For example, by inducing public trust in the executive. And that's all true and important. It is, however, familiar. And uh, my suggestion is that it is only one side of the ledger. The Publius paradox em emphasizes the danger of a myopia about constitutional risks, myopia that tends only 
to that side of the ledger typically emphasized by the liberal theory of constitutionalism. And by the way, of course, when I say liberal, I don't mean in the Fox News sense of liberal versus conservative. I mean liberal in the political theory sense. Okay, um, I've been speaking very loosely of excessive constraints on executive power transmuting into excessive executive power itself. What do I mean by that? What's the benchmark or baseline against which we're defining excessive weakness, excessive strength, terms like this? The first observation I want to make is that um, the paradox is actually agnostic on what counts as excessive on either dimension. It merely says this. It says, suppose you are a designer or at least evaluator of constitutional institutions. You must have some account or other of the desirable scope of executive power. There's no escaping that. Now, have you considered the following possibility? That if you draw the bonds too tight, they may have to be cut when need presents itself. Nothing in that suggestion requires a substantive specification of what the desirable scope of executive power actually is. It merely cautions for a surprising reason it should initially be more capacious, a looser fitting garment than one might otherwise make it. That said, let me clarify, I've in fact implicitly been using two distinct benchmarks or baselines, one of which we might call natural or circumstantial and the other legal. The natural or circumstantial baseline is the one against which excessive weakness is measured. When Hamilton refers to a weak government, he means something like insufficiently capable of taking action in the world, given the natural demands of the political environment and circumstances in which a polity finds itself. The picture is that objective extra-legal necessities of the case make certain measures requisite to the public safety. They may arise from competition among states, from domestic rebellion, from serious criminal activity or terrorism, or any num number of other circumstances. When that excessive weakness becomes excessive strength, by contrast, the second baseline is a legal one. Hamilton's point is that polities will not treat the Constitution not only as a suicide pact, but they will not treat it as a pact to incur serious harm. To meet the necessities of the case, they will transfer requisite power to the organs of government. If one could be assured that the violation of law would go as far as necessary to meet the problem and no farther, it would be unobjectionable. Hamilton is no fetishist of law, and he surely believed, as the Spanish theorist Donoso Cortes put it in a famous speech on dictatorship, the law exists to serve social welfare rather than society existing to serve law. The problem, though, as Hamilton also explains, is that the requisite power may then go too far. Again, in the terms of Federalist 20, the question is whether the usurpation will stop at the salutary point or go forward to a dangerous extreme. There is no general stopping mechanism that can prevent overshooting by the government whose bonds have been cut altogether. History and common experience suggest that those who will hesitate a long time before crossing a red line will often abandon themselves entirely once the line has, in fact, been crossed. But what kind of idea is this analytically? Uh, it's a special case of what Albert, Albert Hirschman called perversity. So for those who know Hirschman's typology of reactionary rhetoric, futility means that an action has no effect. Jeopardy means that it has the intended effect at excessive cost to other values. And perversity means that an action actually produces a state of affairs contrary to what was intended. And the examples I've given um, uh, uh, are intended to fall into that uh, final category. Despite the way it's advertised, Hirschman's typology really has nothing to do with reaction. It's something misleading about it, although it's extremely illuminating. Um, it has nothing to do with reaction in the sense of either undoing change or opposing change. The perverse character of the Publius paradox may often license new departures from the status quo, either simply in virtue of the newly empowered executive or because that executive uses its new power to produce new states of affairs. The executive is the branch that, before all others, wields what the political scientist William G. Howell calls power without persuasion. That is, the power to effect change by taking action on the ground. And that sort of enhanced executive power may be a motor of real world change. And in that sense, the risk of the paradox is to destabilize the status quo ante. 
What institutions does the paradox apply to? Um, I've said it's ambiguous and Publius whether we're speaking of the scope of government generally or the scope of executive power in particular. Um, in Hamilton's Federalist 20, it's the whole jury-rigged government of the states general at issue. Uh, in um, other cases, uh, as in the case of standing armies and some of the examples I've given, the focus is on executive power. Analytically speaking, in, the, in theory, there's no reason why the paradox can't apply to any institution including the legislative powers of Congress, the judiciary, sub-entities in a federalist or devolved system, and so forth. However, I do believe there's a special institutional affinity, not a conceptual necessity, but an institutional affinity between the paradox and the executive power. The affinity arises for the reason I just gave. The executive, whatever we exactly mean by that, is par, par excellence, the institution that can exercise actual power, and here I do mean power, not authority, without the intermediation or consent of other institutions. The executive can take unilateral and extra legal action if natural circumstances so indicate, changing facts on the ground and outside the law books. In this way, the executive is most likely to be able to commit the violations that give the paradox its bite. I believe the best summary is that the paradox is possible in any number of institutions, but most likely to arise in an executive context. Well, um, a final analytic word. Uh, what is the methodological status of this dynamic? Is it something that always occurs given certain institutional and political conditions that we can specify in principle, what we might call a law of institutions? Is it at the other extreme a kind of possibility theorem? Um, I enjoy and consume a, a great number of positive political models, but I do think that a number of them achieve their striking effects by isolating a particular set of conditions under which a counterintuitive result can possibly occur, while quietly sweeping under the rug the question whether the model world possibility is a real political possibility. Um, this is the question of external validity. In Hamilton's hands, the Publius paradox is neither a law nor a mere possibility theorem. At the level of evidence, it describes a sequence of events that's attested in a number of historical cases. Methodologically, I think it's best described as a causal mechanism in Jan Elster's sense, a standing tendency of institutions that can be used ex post to explain what has occurred, even if it's very difficult to make it the basis for law-like predictions ex ante. However, that doesn't mean that the understanding of the mechanism has no practical forward-looking value. Armed with knowledge of its existence, a designer of institutions, or even an academic evaluator of institutions, will tend to all else equal to support more expansive executive power in the first instance. Let me turn now to that set of issues. What does understanding the Publius paradox do for us? I want to be clear that there is a sense in which it does nothing for us, nothing at all. Uh, in that sense, the paradox does nothing for us because it merely corrects a distorted understanding of constitutional risk. It doesn't prescribe what to do once our understanding of constitutional risks is undistorted. That will depend upon the nature of uh, the full set of risks we face, their expected costs, and the expected costs of the available alternatives. By speaking of, of expected costs, um, I presuppose a Bayesian model. I just want to be clear that's not a model I share. I'm a Frank Knight disciple, but I just say that as a quick and dirty shorthand. The point is that just as invalidating a tribunal's reasoning as arbitrary does not specify what decision the tribunal should reach when reasoning in a valid manner, so too awareness of the paradox does not have determinate consequences. However, I do think it's possible to say a bit more at a general level. I'll make two points, one about the conditions under which the paradox will occur, and one about implications for the design of constitutions and constitutional rules. I've said that the paradox is surprising only against the backdrop of a standard thought of liberal constitutionalism, which is that executive power must be constrained to prevent abuses. The paradox suggests there's another side of the ledger, such that myopic constitutional theorizing about the executive is a serious mistake. 
However, as a logical matter, this means only that the risk of the paradox occurring has to be attended to along with other risks. One wants to know in principle the conditions under which the risk will or will not materialize. I have no general answer to this question as yet. I think it would imply a very large research program. An analogy would be the large body of literature attempting to specify under what conditions nations will go to war. The problem isn't merely the burdens of research investigation. There's a deeper conceptual issue in the nature of the case uh, when dealing with executive prerogative. The whole point is that the paradox depends upon circumstances that cannot be fully anticipated and specified in advance. One of the preconditions for its occurrence is that natural circumstances not already provided for in specified rules requires action beyond or even inconsistent with those rules. I think here we're very close to the central problem about executive power, which must always stand in an uneasy relationship to liberal constitutionalism. That said, um, let me offer an observation as a matter of what the economists call comparative statics. So this is a proposition in the form as, for example, as X increases, Y increases. My observation is that I think the paradox will tend to become most significant when a polity is politically polarized and divided. Think, just for example, the United States 2018. To see this, imagine a polity of unanimous political views faced with new and dangerous natural circumstances political or military or what have you. Such a polity could, in theory, with maximum rapidity, simply enact new authorities, perhaps via legislation, using procedures of unanimous consent. In a polarized polity, however, the veto gates, the blocking points of a hamstrung constitution can easily be shut, thereby increasing the risk of expanding reliance on prerogative in a twilight zone or even the risk of extra legal action that becomes embedded as a constitutional convention. This is the leopards in the temple. Of course, there are many other cross-cutting considerations, but as far as this one variable goes, excessive checks and balances pose the greatest risk in polarized fractious polities. The bite of this dynamic, uh, or this comparative statics observation, if it's true, is that polarized polities are exactly the sort of polity that would be most inclined to institute checks on the executive, uh, as in the case of the Netherlands I started with. So the suggestion would be that precisely where checks are in fact most needed and where they're most likely to be observed, they're also most likely to be perverse. So that I hope is a bleak, bleak message. Well, um, let me end with uh, the loose-fitting garment, a point about constitutional design. Armed with knowledge of the paradox, our undistorted understanding of constitutional risk regulation will counsel in favor of a more capacious scope for power than would, we would otherwise deem appropriate. The counterintuitive precaution against dictatorship is to make constitutionalism a loosely-fitting garment, giving government powers adaptable to the vicissitudes of future crises. Chief Justice John Marshall in McCullough versus Maryland in 1819 applied this thought to the powers of Congress. He wrote that the provisions about legislative power in the new US Constitution are intended to endure for ages to come and to be adapted to the various crises of human affairs and on that ground supported an expansive construction of congressional power. Marshall's immediate point was about the limits of foresight he went on to say that to have prescribed the means by which government should in all future time execute its powers would have been an unwise attempt to provide for exigencies, which if foreseen at all must have been seen dimly and which can best be provided for as they occur. This is very much a part of the paradox. If constitutional rulemakers had perfect foresight, they could simply provide for all contingencies ex ante. Because they do not, they need to leave play in the joints. Interestingly, however, I don't think this is the richest case for constitutionalism as a loosely fitting garment. The richest case for it was offered by a Victorian barrister, one of my favorites, J.F. Stephen, uh, who wrote a brilliant essay on the Federalist, um, with which I will close. Um, Stephen's essay, this is a bit of a digression, but Stephen's essay on the Federalist starts with the observation that 
Americans can't stop talking about the Federalists, so I feel I've illustrated his thesis uh, with this very talk. So this, this is a self-mocking tribute to, uh, to J.F. Stephen. Well, Stephen offered a different angle on the paradox um, based on the political psychology of office holding. His idea was that excessive constitutional constraint and rigid policing of the separation of powers itself affects the motivation and self-conception of public officials, undermining their commitment to the overall public interest. Um, I hope you'll forgive me for uh, cl closing the talk with a, a bit of a passage from Stephen. I assure you it's worth the cognitive investment. I don't believe in PowerPoints or whatever, so I am going to read it to you. The doctrine of the separation of powers, this is Stephen now, the doctrine of the separation of powers, the result of the somewhat hasty and incomplete political and social theories of the 18th century had immense practical consequences. By drawing a sharp, clear outline around each man's sphere of authority and around the sphere of the authority of the government itself taken as a whole, it greatly diminished the moral checks upon power. Assume that a ruler is a mere agent for a limited purpose and remind him of this ceaselessly by hemming him in on all sides with legal restraints. And he ceases to feel himself responsible for the condition of the country and becomes by the nature of the case a party man asking for the interests of his masters, those who put him where he is. Deal with power simply as an existing fact. Lay down no propositions at all about its origin. Leave its precise extent undefined and you not only provide a reserved fund of vigor, which on great occasions may be capable of efforts essential to the preservation of the community, but you invest the holder of this authority with characteristics, which both in his own eyes and in the eyes of others, put him under moral obligations to the community at large, far stronger than the legal obligations which restrain a mere official, and far more wholesome than the moral obligations which bind a man to his party. Stephen is observing uh, in modern lingo that extrinsic legal checks and internalized moral checks might be substitutes rather than complements. Enhancing the former by instituting a strong separation of powers risks crowding out or diluting the latter. If the substitution effect dominates, the perverse result may be to diminish constraint overall. Stephen's striking conclusion is that the constitutional rulemaker would do well to leave the scope of official power somewhat undefined, at least around the edges, at least more than we would otherwise believe correct. It seems fitting, I think, that we've come full circle in a certain way. Um, the Publius paradox was articulated by Alexander Hamilton, deeply English in his thinking, and I think it was best articulated and captured by an English lawyer as well. So thank you all. Thank you. Adrian, I want to thank you for an incredibly thought-provoking lecture. Um, and you ended on a a very reflective note and um, possibly also a bleak note, but I do have to say there's never been a better time to be a constitutional lawyer. Um, constitutions may be ill-fitting garments or loose-fitting garments, but if I may extend the metaphor, there are in places around the world at the moment where they're being absolutely stretched at their seams um, and really tested by that populist um, movements that we see, whether it's in the US with uh, hyperactivity or reactivity from your executive or the UK where we seem to have executive paralysis through the invocation of, of rules that never, ever, nobody thought would be invoked in Italy uh, and in Spain. So, and that's to name just but a few. So thank you very much for an incredibly thought-provoking and if I may say very timely and relevant lecture. Thank you. Thank you.